Thank you, Joe. And um, I'm very honoured, privileged to be here to just add my few thoughts. And I very much appreciate the chance of speaking before lunch rather than after. I, I had to change. I, I was going over to London. The wheels take off in my plane, leaves Dublin Airport at five o'clock. It took me three and a half hours to drive down yesterday afternoon. So I, I said to myself, God, I better give myself a bit of space and not to be completely rushing. Um, so I appreciate that chance to, to speak here. The, the title of what I was going to add, I'm going to shorten down what I was going to say, because, um, well, you're right, you don't want to have lunch too early. At the same time, you don't want me holding you back from your, from your lunch at this stage. But it's quite big. It's kind of zero carbon energy system by 2050. Um, I, might, I want to make change that a couple of ways. First of all, I think it should be zero car, carbon everything by 2050. Our, our ambition, what we need to do if we're going to take climate change seriously, is have an entire economic transfer. It's not just the energy system. It is the entire system has to be zero carbon by 2050. If we're going to play our part in stabilizing our planet and, and be part of the new clean industrial revolution that is taking place. Um, and, I, and I want to maybe in that context just uh, obviously concentrate on Galway. And I want, if I can as well, maybe to just vision this through the lens of the new national planning framework. You know, people are aware that there, there's a process at the moment where government is, is trying to look again at how, what's our spatial planning for our country. The spatial plan that was first done back in 2000 didn't exactly uh, work out. We pretty much ignored all, everything what we were saying we were going to do. Um, but it was, it, that was the first attempt in terms of trying to think in terms of spatial planning of the country. We're coming back to it now again, Simon Coveney as, as lead minister, and this time we have got to get it right. Uh, and I think it's actually a good process. I, th I think it provides an opportunity. And I think that for a variety of reasons. First, I think we've learned some of the lessons. One of the changes I think this time is that it's not going to be a top-down centre of Dublin telling the rest of the country which places are going to be growth centres, which centres are not. That's not going to work. It has to throw it back to each region, city, part of the country, each town in my mind, each village, each community, and say, how do you think you're going to develop? And you come forward with the ideas as to how your place is going to develop. And, and as long as those plans fit in within a certain, there's a certain kind of assumptions backing it up, one of the first assumptions would be that it has to be low carbon. Um, and, and if I can say earlier on, I think, uh, this ambition is important. I agree with what John Mullen said over there. It is a lack of ambition has been one of our biggest problems in why we're not meeting our climate targets. Minister Nocton has a different view. He's been saying, oh, we were too ambitious in our time back in government in terms of setting ambitious targets for 2020. I absolutely am proud we went set and went for those high targets. That's what we need to be doing. I slightly disagree. I, you hear this kind of argument here today. Oh, we have to consider three aspects in our competitiveness a security of supply and environmental considerations. We have to start thinking now actually outside that box and think first and foremost, we have to go low carbon. That comes before everything in my mind. That is a physical reality that you cannot ignore. The other variables you can change one way or the other, how you achieve competitiveness, how you achieve security of supply. You cannot go uh, change what the physics of what we have to do in terms of going towards a low carbon system. So we have to be ambitious. And a fundamental problem, as John Mullen says, it's not just in our political system lacking ambition. Our entire administrative system is not equipped with the right understanding of economics, of new economics, as to how actually we start making investment decisions and start doing planning in this low carbon way. And this all has to come into our national planning framework. So the projects that are coming back from cities and communities, in my mind, they have to have that first Take that first kind of caveat that whatever we're going to do is low carbon. So we need to start thinking in a new economic way about how our cities and regions develop and what projects are really viable within that context. Um, the second change, I think, the second assumption within the, the, this plan is that we have to stop that sprawl that has happened in the last 30, 40 years. The statistics are clear when you look at the statistics, the average commuting distance in, uh, in our lives, it's doubled, trebled in the last three or four decades. We have to stop doing that. It is not in our interests as a people to be stuck, 30,000 of us commuting into Galway and out every day, stuck in traffic. It's the same in Dublin, it's the same in Cork, same in Limerick. This donut around each of our cities, 
we have to bring life back to the centre of our villages, towns and cities because it's better quality of life we will get from it, because it's more efficient services in everything we do. We cannot provide public services effectively and efficiently if we're sprawled all over the community, all over the place. We need people back into the centres of our villages and towns so they can walk to the pub at night and have a few pints, so that the local school, the child does not have to be driven to school, they have the freedom again to walk and to cycle and make their own way in life from a fairly young age. So second, they're pretty much the two caveats I'd put to the National Planning Framework and I'd put to you, the people of Galway. So are you on for it? Does Galway want to go green is the question I have. Are you real about that? Do you really want to do it? Are, are we talking glass plumos? Is Galway going to be just roundabouts, out of town retail units and ring roads? Or does it want to go green? And it's up to Galway to decide that can't be imposed from outside, it has to come from here. I just offer my couple of thoughts from outside um, about how that might work. When we're going low carbon, if you simplify down what we have to do, we have to travel lighter, we have to waste less, we have to eat better, and we have to be energy clever. They're the four areas where we consume and, you, and emissions are created. And going green is not a negative. If you look at where the economic development can come for a place like Galway, it seems to me there are four legs to the school, all of which will benefit by us going green. In tourism, in food, in energy, and in digital services. That's the economic development opportunity we have. All, I would argue, can benefit by going green. Just four, maybe a few ideas in that regard. I'm very glad that Creature are one of the sponsors of the event here and that they have this wind farm that they're building with SSE in terms of uh, the Galway Bay wind farm. It's interesting today, I think their minister, Andrew Doyle, is opening a, a conference down in Strad Valley on, on the future of con con continuous cover forestry. I was talking to him about that yesterday in the Dáil. But I think there's a wider issue in this planning framework where we are. We have to think about how we manage our land in every aspect, because we cannot ignore that. As I said, it's not just energy. It has to be food, agriculture, and land use in this big ambitious climate plan we need. From what I hear, and you have to listen to forests and the scientists and the, the, the experts, but most of the people, foresters and others I talk, acknowledge that there's going to be a very different forestry future for the west of Ireland to the east. That the land conditions, the soil conditions, the growing conditions, everything about it requires it has different characteristics. Perhaps a less commercial forestry in the west. And I think we should be big and ambitious and thinking about actually how we use the land here in the West and say, let's take hundreds of thousands of acres from Bordemona and Cuilce. Let's put it together in a new national park. Because I think that's what's going to bring value to the West and jobs and a sustainable low carbon future. To really think busy. Let's separate the National Parks and Wildlife Service and have a National Parks and Wildlife Service that is properly resourced to really think if we let's take this Wild Atlantic Way idea and really go big on it in how we use our land. And I think that actually makes forestry sense from the foresters that I talk to. It's not going to be the same here in a bog land in the west of Ireland than it is on the side of the hills in Wicklow or somewhere like that where forests grow in a very different way. And first and foremost, it means starting putting, well, Harris here from Bank of Ireland saying earlier on, you're looking at the ideas about how you finance for biodiversity, how you finance nature in a sense. That's the new economics that is coming. There is a value on biodiversity. There's a value in nature. There's a value in our bogs that we need to respect and start paying people for tendering that. I love looking across the bay here and seeing the burn, the far side, the likes of what Brendan Dunford is doing in Burren Bio in terms of valuing nature and actually working with farmers, like not seeing them as the enemy to this green revolution. He's turned them round so they're actually, the flat cap guys are out there with him on the front line of making the change we need to make. It's that level of ambition and thinking we need to go. I know it's tough yesterday in Tipperary that people get plant closed, there's 70 jobs lost. We have to manage that, we need a just transition. Another characteristic of this, as well as being ambitious, it has to be a just transition where we look after those workers in old fossil fuel industries who are going to have to change tack. They have a proud record, they're proud people, good workers, good companies, but it needs to change. I'm sorry I heard earlier on the idea that we switch money point to gas. We have enough combined cycle gas plants, thank you. We need to shut down money point, we need to shut down the peat fired power stations today. 
if we're serious about this transition. We can do it. We've enough combined cycle gas. We, we can get to it with interconnection, wind, and, and combined cycle gas. We can power this country economically. We do not need those big old fossil fuel plants. And listen, we need to win over the workers on that and win over the people of the West of Ireland where that's not seen as me as some Dublin Jack Heen telling you, oh, you have to change your ways. I'm a proud tradition of cutting turf. We do. But we need to switch that proud tradition into proud tradition of caring for our land in the West. And I think if we do that, tourism will flourish. It will work. That's what people, I worked in 15 years in tourism. I, more than anyone else, I think I brought people up and down that road in front of us here. And I know what they're coming for. They're coming for a sense of something special. Yes, in our welcome, but also in our land. They buy into the whole St. End out in his island there, or Coleman out in Boffin, or the Banshee, or all this mythological stuff. That's part of what people come here for. Let us give it to them in terms of a land that is cherished, which is special, which is different, which is doing this stewardship thing in a really good way. And we will create employment. We have to think about development, not just a Galway city. We need to get Bangareras working, a Ballinasloe, or Boyle, or all these small communities that are going to rely on tourism. We need to spread it out from just large base centres to actually do what Coleman looked out from Boffin, looked across, the, what's it called, Maya na, Maya na, na Sosnuk. He sent the English monks in to set up a community near Castlebar. Spread it out. Make everywhere special, and we do that by looking after the land. Same in food. You were talking earlier on about what sort of innovation you're getting, what are people investing in. You said precision agriculture. That's what we need to do. The, the Chagas research, Roger Schuster, before he went off to Holland again, showing that profitability in farming goes with environmental sustainability. Green is not the enemy of the farmer. We are friends. But you have to do it in a precision way. Danny Healy Ray's office is across the road from me. Everyone always says to me, God help you, you have to deal with Danny Healy Ray. I hug Danny Healy Ray every day. <laughs> We're not going to make this transition if it's an exclusive left-wing liberal city centre snobbery thing. I listen to Danny, the phone's going all the time. It's kind of literally shouting, hello, what's, the, what's wrong with the cow? <laughs> That's where I want to be. So that he and everyone like him thinks this is their transition because we will not win our people over if it's just an urban elite thing. There has to be a real sense that Danny's on our side and explain to Danny, Danny, here's where it works. Here's where you're going to get a better price for that cow and how it's going to work. That's the way we need to go. And it has to be precision farming with the likes of Burn Bio, really advanced and you get a better price because you're using the land we have in a really clever way and you're marketing it as green because it's genuinely green, really origin glass in everything we do. In energy, and I'm brief, I've been kind of tight for time, and you're ready for lunch. Um, it's a strange world, it's changed. The people I'm going to see in London or climate people, they wouldn't get out of bed for less than 250 megawatts. It's, I kid you not. It's the way it's going. Even the renewables now, it's, we're talking scale, that's beyond belief. I've been involved in the last five years with a company called E3G, looking at the North Sea's offshore grid initiative. I was at a conference in Brussels last month. There's one project they're looking at. It's a 90 gigawatt project. 90 gigawatts. That's half of German's electricity demand in one massive, massive offshore wind project that they're looking at. And it's, it's, it's game over. Someone said, to, Mr. Coyne said, why, why not nuclear? Nuclear, I'm sorry, it's old, dangerous, out of hat, expensive technology. Those offshore wind farms are coming in and bidded now at five cents a kilowatt hour. It's game over. Same with solar. They're bidding in the Middle East the two or three, two and a half cent a kilowatt hour. So it's going to be renewable. And it's, a lot of it's going to be at scale. Um, and we have real potential. I think one of the projects that's sitting there ready to go, now when I say ready to go, it'll probably take 10 years, is for us to build a significant offshore wind farm in the, mid, in the Irish Sea. Connect it into the Isle of Man for converter stations and ship it into the UK. Scotland connecting in as well. And the UK, no matter what happens at Brexit, my reading of what's going on, when I talk to people involved in the, the, in the negotiations, energy cooperation is going to be agreed early on, and it's not in dispute. It's in ever an interest to have this greater interconnection. The UK just had a, they changed their modelling plans. They're saying they want 12 gigawatts of interconnection, 12 gigawatts of offshore wind, and 12 gigawatts, I think, of new gas-fired stations between now and 2030. That's what they're doing. 
and they're doing it because it makes sense. In this world where we have to manage the variable power supply, interconnection is critical because that's the cheapest way of doing this balancing system. That's true what John said in terms of what's happening in Brussels legislatively, the winter package, which is going through at the moment, it'll take about another 12 months for it to get through the Parliament, uh, is all about the changes now seen as clearly as this. The first quarter of the transition we made, we inserted, this is in the electricity system now, we inserted renewables into the existing system. It's worked. Pretty much most places like Ireland is at that 25% stage. The next quarter of the transition, the entire system changes because it can't work. Renewables are already changing the way how the whole system works, changing investment signals. So the next quarter of the transition, the entire system changed from this baseload chasing demand to this variable dance between supply and demand. And this dance is in a myriad of different ways. We heard some of them earlier on in terms of you know, data centers using their backup capacity and switching on and off. That's going to happen with everything. And we need to be good at that. Galway could be good at that. And to make it work, it's actually not about the technology, it's about winning over the people. It's about however you get public confidence in terms of sharing data and experimenting and being willing to make mistakes. One of the other things in this transition we have to wake up and own up to is we will do some things that won't work. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. We shouldn't be afraid of testing and learning. I mean, God help us, that Atten Rye apple plant, that's, I was listening to someone saying this morning, still stuck in planning, roughly the same time that we started thinking about that, the Danes thought about a data center as well, they're commissioning theirs as we speak, we're still stuck in planning. What we'll miss out on that is not just the jobs in Athen Rye or the construction activity and so on, but how you run as something like the Athen Rye data center with 100%, which is their aim now, 100% renewable system, it's that balancing trick. If we learned that here, and we are good at this, we're, we are good, our grid company is good at this, our, engine, our, our energy companies can be good at this, but giving ourselves those sort of chests and challenges is what Galway should be doing in my mind, because that's where the new economy is coming, that's the future, and why couldn't we be good at that? Um, I could go on, there's a whole myriad of different, part of that being good at things is sensory systems. As in the fourth leg of the stool, if it's food, energy, uh, tourism, the fourth one is digital services. So that being good at the dance is where that fourth leg of, uh, of economic opportunity applies. And again, I think we should be thinking big. I remember years ago, I went to the board of IBM in upstate New York, I think it was, and on the map, the boardroom, big office, there was, they had Smart Bay Galway up there as one of their big projects they were really proud of. I think we need to go a step further. I think we should be saying to IBM headquarters, we, you've done the work in the Bay, now we want to go out into the Atlantic. As well as having a national park on the West Coast, let's go out into our marine, in the 10 times our land area, let's take now not hundreds, now hundreds of thousands of square kilometers and say, we fence that off. There is no oil, oil or gas exploration. We stop fishing for the moment and we start monitoring what's going on in the North Atlantic. That is our role as international citizens, I think, because no one really knows what's going on in the North Atlantic. One of the risks in climate change is that the Gulf Stream will start to change. It's already seemingly happening. So I would say maybe some, an, an, an idea for ambition is massive marine parks off the west coast of Ireland and a major scientific undertaking to do, take the sort of sensors we have in the Smart Bay project in Galway and to go out into the Atlantic at scale and measure the ecology and the meteorology and the, of what is happening, and the oceanography. That, those sort of projects, if Galway comes back with that, I'd love to see a government say no. I know you'd have the head of the, Mail, the Navy and the Armed Forces, Commander Mellet, listen to him talking about this, he gets it. Because he knows we don't really, we're not really managing it. That's the scale of the projects, if we came forward with, I think it would really work. Lastly, this is a strange transition. It has to be ambitious. It has to be a just transition. It's this strange mix of competitive and collaborative. If Galway's good at this, that doesn't undermine Cork or Limerick. Because they'll come up with, I mean, and, and it's happening. What John Mullins said is true. What I hear is that Cork Chamber is actually fairly ahead of the game. It's starting to think collectively in a Cork way 
about how Cork it might advance. Now, I think, though, I'm very glad the Global Chamber is organising this event, but I, to be honest, I haven't heard anything on the national stage yet where some of the people say to me, and you hear in the grapevine, do you know what, Galway's got his act together, Galway's working as a team with some sort of ambitions. I hear no, I hear no, the green, what's happened to the Greenway? From Dublin to, Ath to Athlone, we've got it, but from there on, I don't know, it's, where is it? Where's the Greenway to Clifton? Where's the Athenry Data Centre? You know, it, it needs to come up from Galway now. And I think it needs to come in a whole range of different plans and initiatives. It has to be real. It has to be green. And I think what we can learn in Galway, then we apply in Cork, in Limerick, in Waterford and elsewhere, in Dublin too. We're not competing. It's not Dublin versus Galway. Dublin's going to have to do this too. We have just as big a challenge. So it's it kind of made competitive in the sense that you're getting some of the capital funds are maybe just natural rivalry but it's also collaborative. It's not a zero-sum game, it's a cooperative game. That's the nature of this new clean economy. It's both competitive and collaborative. In the digital world, in clean energy, it's community-centered. It's centered around the citizen. It's a different economics we need. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.